This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Well, welcome everyone. It's a great pleasure to see you all here today. It's a big day. It's a beautiful day. And uh, I'm really impressed that you would forsake such a beautiful California day for sitting in Memorial Auditorium for three hours. So thank you for your commitment to sustainability. I'd like to uh, acknowledge especially the presence of uh, some special guests, and I will get to them in the course of the next few minutes, but in particularly the Chair of the Board of Trustees, Bert McMurtry. It's good to see you here, Bert. Today's program is brought to you by the Woods Institute for the Environment, along with uh, the Energy Crossroads. For those of you who are not familiar with Woods, I'll just take a minute to explain what, what Woods is about. Uh, Woods Institute for the Environment uh, was formed to bring together the brightest minds in the public and private sectors uh, together with Stanford faculty to create practical solutions to the environmental challenges of the 21st century for both people and the planet. By harnessing the expertise and the imagination of researchers across all seven schools at Stanford, as well as partner institutions, the Woods Institute's is there to put these solutions into the hands of the people who can affect change the most. In the same spirit that inspired Stanford's role in Silicon Valley, we are committed to pioneering innovative approaches to meet the environmental challenges of today and tomorrow. Energy Crossroads is a student-initiated global movement for a clean, prosperous, and secure energy future. To do this, Energy Crossroads is committed to mobilizing a coalition that includes stakeholders from across many sectors and disciplines. The coalition includes policymakers, non-governmental organizations, technologists, entrepreneurs, academics, and activists. Energy Crossroads works to facilitate collaboration between these groups, guided by the belief that by doing so, we will accelerate progress towards innovative solutions to the world's energy challenges. The title of today's seminar, or symposium rather, is Sustainable Places, Leadership in the Public and Private Sectors. What better place than California and Stanford University to hold this event? The state of California has made a huge commitment to reducing its greenhouse gas emissions and to addressing the climate change challenge. One only needs scan the Clim California Climate Change Portal, and I encourage you, if you haven't looked at it, it's very, very informative. You just need to look at it pretty quickly to see that California is a leader in standards, in laws, and incentives to achieve this goal. It is leading the fight against global warming and setting an example for the rest of the world by passing legislation such as AB 32 or AB 1493. Just to give you a flavor, here are some examples of California institutions playing a vital role in our sustainability challenge. First, the Public Utilities Commission plays a key role in making California a national and international leader on a number of clean energy related initiatives and policies designed to benefit consumers, the environment, and the economy. And we're delighted that Diane Greenwich, one of the five commissioners on the Public Utilities Commission and a member of the Advisory Council of the Precourt Institute for Energy Efficiency, is with us today. The California Energy Commission is the state's primary energy policy and planning agency. Created by the legislature in 1974, the commission has responsibility for, among others, promoting energy efficiency through appliance and building standards and developing energy technologies and supporting renewable energy. 
California legislature also established the Air Resources Board in 1967 to attain and maintain healthy air quality and to conduct research into the causes of and solutions to air pollution. The ARB is also responsible for the implementation of a Senate Bill 32, the Climate Change Bill. And Board Chair Mary Nichols will be sharing her thoughts on this a little later. We should also acknowledge the leadership and roles of cities and counties in establishing programs to fight global warming and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In December of last year, San Francisco Mayor Gavin Newsom proposed some of the most ambitious new building codes based on the highest standards of green design. And the mayor will be with us in a little while to share his thoughts on this challenge and to talk about San Francisco's plans for the future. And finally, the roles of corporations and the venture capitalist community in bringing about venture capital community, excuse me, in bringing about fundamental change has been enormous. And the Bay Area and California institutions in particular have been in the vanguard in this. And today we welcome Christina Page from Yahoo and Peter Williams from IBM, who will talk about what they are doing in the sustainability realm. So what about Stanford's journey? What is Stanford? doing. 19, uh, in 2004, excuse me, the initiative on the environment and sustainability was launched by President John Hennessy to find solutions to the major environmental and sustainability challenges of the 21st century and to educate leaders who will be critical to implementing these solutions. Some of the major challenges we find are among others providing drinking water and sanitation for one to two billion people on this planet, protecting and restoring the fisheries of the ocean, providing clean energy to all inhabitants of the planet while reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and providing sustainable and secure sources of food while protecting biodiversity. The Woods Institute, of which I'm one of the directors, and I'd like to acknowledge as well the presence of my co-director, Buzz Thompson, was created as an interdisciplinary hub and catalyst for the initiative. And the mission of the initiative is quite simple and it's quite urgent. How do we provide food, energy, water, shelter for all humankind while protecting the life support systems of this planet? Woods and the Initiative on the Environment is addressing this challenge through programs that promote interdisciplinary research, that take ideas and brings them into action and educates and training leaders. But the initiative on the environment and sustainability is more than just an academic endeavor. And that's why we are here today. At its core is the question of how Stanford itself will conduct its business in the 21st century. The initiative is a bold statement that not only are we committed to finding solutions to global problems, but we're also committed to reducing our own carbon footprint, our own use of critical sources such as energy and water. And we know that manufacturing and operation of buildings produces a major share of greenhouse gas emissions. The estimates are anywhere between 35 to 40 percent of greenhouse gas emissions originate in the architectural or the building sector. So Stanford is committed to reduce its own greenhouse gas emissions not only by retrofitting its existing buildings, but also building more energy efficient, high performance buildings. Now green buildings on campus include the award winning uh, Sunfield Station at Jasper Ridge, and hopefully many of you have visited there, as well as the uh, headquarters of the Carnegie Institution on the campus. The new Graduate School of Business campus, which is currently in the planning phase, is strongly committed to being green as well. But today, the focus is on the new Jerry Yang and Akiko Yamazaki Environment and Energy Building, affectionately referred to on campus as Y2E2. Y2E2 is the coming together place and the home of the initiative on the environment and sustainability at Stanford. In this context, it is much more than a building. It is part of our effort to change the entire university's approach to research and education in order to address some of the world's most pressing needs. 
It is itself not only the home for the creation of ideas that will change the world and make it a more sustainable place, but it is also a symbol of what is possible in this regard. It is designed for problem solving. It is designed to conserve. It is designed to inspire. And it is designed to teach. With a total area of approximately 166,000 square feet, it will house a community of approximately 500 students and staff, all focused on issues related to environment, energy, and sustainability. They will be joined by a regular influx of visitors and temporary occupants from elsewhere on campus. The building also will become a perfect meeting ground for leaders from business, government, NGOs, and academia to discuss environment and energy issues in a neutral forum, firmly grounded in science and informed by other fields. The building's design was carefully planned in consultation with faculty and students to meet three objectives provide state-of-the-art research space, promote collaborative work, and demonstrate sustainable building practices. Perhaps the most important feature of a design in this regard is the way the occupants will be grouped, not by academic discipline, not by department, but according to the problems they hope to solve. So five focal areas define the building's layout, reflecting the themes of the environmental initiative, marine and oceans, fresh water, energy and climate systems, land use and conservation, and the sustainable built environment. The Yang and Yamazaki Environment Energy Building must practice what its occupants preach by being as energy and resource efficient as possible. The building exemplifies sustainable design and construction that is both attractive and economically sound. To begin with, the project followed sustainable construction practices that reduced construction waste by 80%. The building's design will reduce energy consumption by 57% and potable water consumption by 30% for the building and as close to 100% as possible for landscape irrigation compared with traditional design standards. We hope that all of these energy saving measures in the building will pay for themselves within six to eight years. Some of the features that promote interaction among the building's occupants are also part of the building's energy conservation strategy. The four atria, for example, function at the building's lungs by circulating fresh air and distributing natural light in conjunction with extensive use of glass and other translucent materials. The journey we undertook in creating Y2E2 brought us face to face with many tough issues. We were faced with hard choices at every turn regarding trade-offs between aesthetics, comfort, tradition, program, and sustainability. These are the trade-offs that others in the private and public sector are wrestling with every day. How do you become more sustainable while maintaining profitability and functionality? How do you fulfill your role as a global citizen in reducing your consumption while answering to your shareholders and your constituents? How do you retain and sharpen the competitive edge that brought you success while setting an example for future generations and leaders? In this sense, Y2E2 was also built to inspire us all to take the next steps to sustainability and to confront and meet the challenges posed by these issues. The inspiration is captured perfectly in the words of Jake Murray, Stanford alum and consultant on this project. Jake writes, Y2E2 is many things, a center for collaboration, a research facility, a sustainable building. The building is a vital symbol of Stanford's commitment to sustainability and interdisciplinary study. It is also a center for campus life and given its abundant, sustainable features, it is responsible to the natural systems of which it is necessarily a component. It is part of a global network of interdependent systems, academic, ecological, technological, and social. It declares that a building is a habitat, that a human-made structure is part of a natural system, a campus is a community, and every system is cyclical and not linear.
Thank you, Jake, for those inspiring words, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Well, this brings us to the here and now and our symposium on sustainable places. So I'd like to now welcome, please take a seat, the moderators and panelists who we will hear from in the next few hours for their time today and for their enthusiastic willingness to share their expertise. Training leaders for a sustainable world is at the core of Stanford's environmental initiative and we're pleased to have with us this array of stellar government and corporate leaders who are going to show us the way. It's now my pleasure to introduce the first moderator for our first panel, Jim Sweeney, who's the director of the Precord Institute for Energy Efficiency and professor of management science and engineering at Stanford University. Uh, Jim is also a senior fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research at the Woods Institute and also a senior fellow at the Hoover Institute and I believe a senior fellow too at Freeman Spogli Institute. Jim, how do you find the time? Uh, Jim has, uh, is a senior fellow at the US Association for Energy Economics and a fellow of the California Council on Science and Technology. He's also on the National Advisory Council of the National Renewable Energy Lab and a member of uh, Governor Schwarzenegger's Council on Economic Advisors. Welcome, Jim, and I believe that you are going to introduce the rest of the panel. Thank you all. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we have, have three people um, who are here uh, who will be um, speaking to us. Uh, it's going to be a question, question and answer format. Um, we start with Chris Page uh, from Yahoo. Uh, we go to Peter Williams um, uh, from IBM and Joe Stagner here at, at Stanford University. And I'd like to start with uh, uh, just a general question, uh, very short answer since we have a session about sustainability. Chris, what does sustainability mean to Yahoo? Sustainability means several things to Yahoo. And, you know, first of all, we look at our own operations. We seek to establish a foundation of credibility there by examining our practices and looking for ways to continuously improve things from a sustainability standpoint. Uh, we look for ways to engage our employees who are enthusiastic and ingenious to identify ways that we can further improve what we're doing. And then we've got 500 million users out there. We look for ways to inspire and educate them so they can take action themselves. Yeah. How about you, Peter? It's, um, again, that same combination of internal and external. Um, IBM has been trying to reduce its environmental footprint for about 35 years uh, internally uh, with considerable success. And now, most recently, it's a source of um, product ideas for products and services that we can sell externally. So it's a market. And Joe? Here at Stanford, it means reducing our impact on the environment, conserving resources, and protecting the environment while we conduct our day-to-day -day activities so that we leave the world in a, as good a shape or better as we found it for the future generations. Great. As I ask for very general answers, now let's be more specific. And if we start, um, start with, uh, with you, Peter, of all of the things that you end up doing that leads to sustainability, Where's the biggest action? Where are the things that are really most important that you're ending up doing to create sustainability in IBM? If you're talking about within IBM, um, our primary focus is on two things at this point in time. One is reducing our energy consumption, um, and the other is reducing our use of perfluorocarbons, which we use to make um, semiconductors. And those two things alone have saved us, um, from an economic point of view, um, hundreds of millions of um, uh, dollars over the years, and um, you know hundreds of uh, hundreds of millions of tons of uh, carbon dioxide over the years. At the same time, externally, um, it's a matter of um, understanding where the market is. Um, carbon management is a focus right now. Um, we're expecting water management, for example, to become a focus in 
uh, you know, over the next 18 months to two years. Um, and it's a matter of um, tracking that market and watching it unfold. And there are more and more dimensions to it with every day that passes. Your answer has to be different, uh, Chris, because you don't use any of the same chemicals. Uh, right. Where, where, where is the big action for, for Yahoo? Well, you know, I think there are a variety of leverage points there. I spend an awful lot of time thinking about people and electrons these days. And those are big leverage points for us. Uh, you know, in terms of our operations, Yahoo committed last year to becoming carbon neutral. And what we did is we, we measured our footprint. We looked at our operations globally, our data centers, our office buildings. We looked at employee commuting, and we looked at air travel. And we've been looking for ways to reduce those uh, over time. And one of the announcements we made back in October is uh, purchase of offsets against our entire footprint for 2006. So again, we're looking for leverage points there. When you look at something like our campus, uh, We've got employees there who we engage and educate. Uh, we've got a, it's called the Green Guzzler. Some of you may have seen it. It's a biodiesel fueled, Wi-Fi enabled bus that takes a lot of our employees down from San Francisco in the morning to our headquarters in Sunnyvale. So there's an educational opportunity there. There's a chance to not make our employees fight traffic uh, and do so in a more sustainable way. We also just launched something called the Green Screen, which is this interactive touch screen. It's made by a company called Lucid Technologies, uh, which tracks uh, electricity consumption in our buildings, uh, building by building in real time. So immediately you get Yahoo's writing in saying, why is it so high in building E in the middle of the day? You know? So there's opportunities there in terms of a very educated group of employees getting engaged and enthusiastic and wanting to see what they themselves can do. On the data center front, Data centers have been in the news a lot lately. There's constant innovation there in terms of the operations of our data centers. How do we get those to run more reliably? How do you increase uptime? And how do you limit consumption as much as possible? One of the things we're doing up in Washington State is uh, experimenting with passive cooling. Uh, you use a lot of energy to keep your servers cool. That's one of the major challenges you run into when you're operating these things. Because of the environment up in Washington State, we've got an opportunity to keep them cool without the constant use of heavy duty HVAC equipment. So that's just from an operations standpoint. Getting sure. back to the people though, again, we have a huge number of users who visit Yahoo every single day. We've got a Yahoo Green site that they use to educate themselves, and a very popular site over in Yahoo Autos where you can compare down to minute levels of detail different alternative energy vehicles. So tremendous opportunity there. So I, in some ways I'm translating it, and I lead this in a question for Joe, mm -hmm. is that um, while there's a number of things going on, most of them center about energy use and how you can fundamentally reduce the use of energy, whether it's in transportation or, or server farms or whatever. Is it the same with Stanford, or, or are there other things that are the important initiatives for sustainability? Well, certainly um, the issues of information technology and uh, consolidating uh, computer use and using it more efficiently is a big ingredient. But overall, Stanford is very much like a small city. We provide all of our own energy, uh, water, we manage waste. And so many of our challenges uh, in protecting the environment and conserving resources involve uh, reducing energy use in our buildings, uh, applying new standards of efficiency to buildings to uh, minimize their impact as they come online, and looking at our central energy facility and finding new ways to transform our energy supplies to uh, greener uh, ways in the future. That extends on to considering campus water use. Uh, there's a limited amount of water use that uh, we have entitlement to, and as we grow, we need to find new ways to uh, use that precious resource more uh, wisely. Um, transportation. Much has been done in the area of transportation to uh, minimize and, and, and keep constant without increasing the flows of traffic in the community as Stanford has grown and accepted more students. And uh, so there's been some great improvements in the transportation. So as a city, we have many of the public works type uh, challenges that you might imagine in the area of environmental protection. I got a theme from each, from particularly you, Chris, uh, when you're talking about the actions individuals would take and the information they give, that even though in some, that you, you as a combination of an 
information company and a technology company, there's a lot of behavioral choices that you were, you were talking about. And um, could you, and let me start with you first and then, then move it to the other two panelists. Can you talk about the mix of so that the, the technologies that are important for the sustainability that you put in versus the behavioral issues, uh, how you ask people to, to change their behavior in, in, in order to deal with sustainability. Uh. Right. Well, in terms of technology, uh, you know, one of the things we did when, when we looked for offsets, uh, we reviewed about 100 different projects. And what we came down to is we, we really want to make a difference in areas where Yahoo has a presence. Uh, so one of the things we tried to do is support clean energy technology development in countries where we have an active presence, in Brazil and in India. India's electricity grid is the fifth most carbon intensive on the planet. Uh, so by buying offsets related to wind turbines, we're really trying to accelerate the development of alternative technology in a country that's really at a crossroads in terms of the future for energy. So that's an example of technology. That's a leverage point for us. Data centers, again, are obviously a huge technology. But a huge amount of what we do and a huge part of our leverage is definitely education and offering people options in terms of behavioral changes. 18seconds.org uh, is a partnership we entered in with a whole bunch of different institutions, uh, which encourages people to change a light bulb. It takes 18 seconds to change from a conventional light bulb to a compact fluorescent light bulb. You have to count the active screen it in. And faster if you're faster with your fingers or you have a partner. Um, and one of the things that we provide there is not only the encouragement to do so, but the ability to track across different places in the United States how many. CFLs are getting built in this state. What kind of a difference does that make given how much coal is burned here in terms of greenhouse gas emissions over time? So you can create a little bit of competition between Mississippi and California in terms of compact fluorescent light bulb purchase and changing. Um, so it's an educational tool, it's an encouragement tool, um, and it provides real-time data, which has been found to really influence behavior a whole bunch. Right. Well, if I think about IBM, one of the things that really strikes me is the wonderfully creative television advertisements that, uh, you know, the punchline is stop talking, start doing. And you, you, you sell business services out there, which in some ways will, will lead to not just technology, but behavioral changes. Right. Could you talk about that mix of behavioral changes versus pure technology? In a company, it's fundamentally, I view as, as made its mark as a technology company. Sure, and uh, you go around um, any of our data centers or any of our semiconductor plants or any of our manufacturing plants, you will see um, as much technology dedicated to controlling the environment in those buildings as you could possibly wish to see. You will also see um, a whole bunch of things like posters about here's our energy consumption over the past month, here's our water consumption over the past month, um, here are our targets, these are the things we're doing this year, um, you know, these are the things that we know we're not doing and we would like to get to doing, um, and so on. So you've got that combination of the technology and the, almost the, you know, the change in the way people think. There's a bit of a sense that, you know, um, IBM employs 350,000 people, you can think of them as a microcosm of society, right? Um, society needs to be um, made to understand the consequences of its actions in environmental terms, and IBMers are no different. The difference is that if we can make IBMers understand that, then actually the company makes more money. So you've got that perfect storm. You've got the, the green motive and you've got the, um, the uh, financial motive um, going together. Then when we come to um, looking outside the company, um, a very large part of the green offerings that we um, have created and are now selling are consultancy-based and they are based in large measure around things like accountability and performance metrics and behavioral change um, and organizational change um, designed to enable companies to become um, greener. Um, you know, you can have all the technology you want if you're not organized right, if your people aren't thinking right, if they're not measured right, if the accountabilities aren't right, it doesn't count for anything. So you have to put those things in place as well. So the two things go very much hand in hand. I'll come back to you in a moment, Joe, but I want to follow up on, on a word that you said of profitability. All of these sustainable initiatives, are they profitable for your company? Uh, do they add to the bottom line or take away from the bottom line? I can't um, reveal, in fact, I don't actually know the, um, 
revenue that we're going to make from uh, green products and services this year, but it's measured in the billions of dollars. So it had better be profitable. Uh, otherwise, we've got a problem. Um, there are um, inevitably things that we're just starting up that haven't yet become profitable. There is one area that I can think of that we um, discontinued um, investing in because we realized that the market wasn't going to be sufficient to sustain the kind of investment that it would have needed for us to get into it. Um, but that's one area out of many, many, many. Uh, so, yeah, generally speaking, it's, um, it's good business. How about for Yahoo? Well, I'd say that's one of the reasons why a lot of our green practices focus on energy efficiency, because right. that is, that's a no-brainer. That's something that drops to your bottom line. If you can use fewer electrons, then you are saving money. Uh, from a customer base standpoint, we're seeing tremendous market demand for information on green. It's just been skyrocketing, especially over the last 18 months or so. so it's certainly something that the public is definitely requesting, and our, our customers want as much information as possible about. Is this the only reason you're doing it? Is it profitable, or is there other motivations driving both of your company? I see you've got a number of things, um, and they, they all go together, which is what makes it so powerful. Um, IBM as a company, there seems to be something in the um, culture of IBM that makes us as a group of people um, incredibly aware um, of the environment. I've been doing this job for about a year, um, I have literally lost count of the number of green communities that have been set up using our own sort of internal um, intranet in different countries around the world. The number of resumes, resumes I've received from people looking for, um, you know, wanting to, wanting to work in green areas and so on. So it's something that the company clearly seems to get. Um, so there's that kind of cultural thing. At the same time, we are the, um, the world's third most valuable brand. Um, which is quite an achievement because we don't actually sell to consumers. So I think we kind of scratch our heads and wondering kind of how that happened. Um, but at the same time, there we are. We, we have that very valuable brand. Um, you know, we have to be seen to be um, in step with society and we have to be seen to be, you know, doing our bit to, um, to uh, promote sustainability. And indeed we are. So it's a whole mix of, you know, brand management, um, good business, as I described it just now, and the internal kind of predilections of the people that work for IBM, a really, you know, a really wide mixture. Okay, Chris. <laughs> I'd say, you know, in terms of our commitment to climate neutrality, that, that was something that was made by our co-founders, by uh, Jerry Yang and David Philo, and definitely extends beyond the profit motive. That's something that we made a commitment to last year because of a deep concern about climate change. Buying offsets can't help your bottom line. Buying offsets is something that's our personal commitment to climate change and to reducing. Right. Yeah. I want to go back to the behavioral issues of Stanford because Stanford is just dedicating this, this new building that has a lot of design and technology in it for um, energy efficiency to add to sustainability, but Stanford also has behavioral initiatives. Could you talk about technology and behavior versus or together in, in Stanford in, in dealing with these uh, issues of sustainability? Certainly, I feel they, uh, they inform each other. Um, Stanford's behavior, its decision to uh, pursue sustainability vigorously uh, through construction of the Y2E2 building and establishing very efficient uh, standards for a new construction for creation of the department that I now lead, the Sustainability and Energy Management Department, and for the, the many uh, academic institutions uh, and, and work that's being done to globally inform and educate others on sustainability is an example of the power of behavior. Uh, that power then informs uh, the development of technology. Uh, if society and the citizens demand something better, to borrow from one of, one of your lines, Jim, we don't need to freeze in the dark to solve this problem. Society simply has to be informed about the problem and collectively have the uh, willpower to say we want something better. Uh, that willpower then informs uh, folks like the panelists you'll see later and, and Governor Schwarzenegger and others to then invest in the uh, uh, innovation and the research that will develop the technologies that will allow us all to be more sustainable without shivering in the dark to do it. So I think some of the greatest power of uh, behavioral changes citizens have Arnon learning to turn your lights off, which certainly is a great part of the ingredient, but the power there is in the collective willpower to understand the problem, educate yourselves about it, and then demand something better uh, from our leaders who can uh, cause that action to happen that will lead to research at Stanford and at these companies to provide the new knowledge and the services and the, uh, 
uh, technology that will allow us all to emerge from this challenge successfully. With your vast experience, Peter, in this and you as in your company, you must be a group of important lessons that you can be offering to other companies besides the services that you sell them as a business consulting service. What, what would you tell the people here in the audience of, about some of the most important lessons for if they want to start approaching sustainability in their own organizations, corporations, what are the lessons that they should be thinking about um, to start moving forward? Uh, I think there's several. The first is um, it isn't just about the technology. Um, I'll give you a good example of that. Uh, we do a lot of work in helping companies reduce the energy intensity of their data centers. We own more data center square footage than any other company in the world, we think, um, or any other organization in the world, we think. Um, the, um, one of the commonest problems we find is that they've used the, um, the uh, ducting, the HVAC, heating and ventilation ducts underneath the um, data centers as cable runs. So the uh, ventilation um, can't work properly. Well, it's not a technology solution, but just get the cable in the heck out of the ducts and then it works better. <laughs> and you've just saved, you know, 5% of your data centers, data centers energy bill potentially. So it's, the first lesson really is it's not just about fancy technology and, you know, new gizmos and new processes. It's actually look at the basic stuff. Um, the second lesson would be I think the concept of footprinting uh, can sometimes become a recipe for analysis paralysis. Um, you know, if you know you're using more energy than you need to, then go ahead and cut it. You don't need a footprint to tell you to do that. Um, you know, if you know you, even, even down to a personal level, you know, if I know my kids are leaving the lights on, I don't need a footprint to tell, me, uh, to tell them that it's a good idea to turn them off. I just cut their pocket money, it works a treat. <laughs> uh, um, you know, it, so, you know, keep it simple uh, would, be, would be another lesson, I think. I think the third lesson is then, as we were saying, tap into the motivation of your employees, if you're running a business anyway, tap into the motivation of your employees um, to, um, you know, to, to start to drive this forward. Um, as I say, I'm in a kind of a dual position in the sense that IBM is making um, all of these uh, improvements internally and we're trying to sell stuff. There's a huge linkage there. Um, I was really glad when I took this job to discover that IBM was in fact world class um, at managing its own environmental footprint because my job would have been incredibly hard um, if it wasn't. And we leverage a lot of what we do internally directly to sell um, externally. So look inside yourself, look inside your company, what have you got that you can turn into some kind of environmental business just as you know, Yahoo is doing. Their business is information and that's what they're using. Our business is computing and business processes and that's what we're using. Um, so, I mean, there, there, there's a few thoughts. And Chris, what are your key lessons? You know, in terms of other companies, just really understanding your own impact, not, not paralysis by analysis. You don't need to measure every single pound of carbon before you have an understanding of the direction you should go in. In fact, you can spend years doing that. Um, and I don't think you should. But a real understanding of where are your leverage points. We look very different from a fast food chain, for example, in terms of our impact and where our opportunities and leverage points are. Um, and really understanding your culture and what's going to motivate and inspire your employees. Um, an example of that from Yahoo that is probably not transferable, say, to IBM, is, uh, is one that I was exposed to uh, the day I came in to interview for my job. Um, for Earth Day last year, the challenge to employees on Yahoo's campus was reduce our energy consumption for one week by 20%. And do that by carpooling to work, uh, turning off lights, powering down your energy monitor, uh, forego one red meat uh, dish over the course of the week. Uh, and there was a reward associated with this. And I discovered what the reward was when I got there. I finished a day's worth of interview and they said, aha, you should stick around for the sumo wrestling. And I said, I beg your pardon? Um, so our co-founders, Jerry Yang and David Feil, this was my introduction to the two of them, they, they donned these sumo wrestling suits to, to honor the employees who had reached their 20% energy reduction goal. Um, and I was treated to hundreds of Yahoo standing out on the main campus waving signs for their favorite co-founder um, as they did best two out of three in these giant sumo wrestling suits with a helmet. <laughs> now, that's uniquely Yahoo. Um, that's how we motivate behavior. Um, I, it might work at Stanford. I don't think it would work terribly well at IBM, but something else might. Something you know? else might. Yeah, so yeah. understanding your employees uh, and the culture and what's going to tap into their passion and talent uh, is a very important part of the successful sustainability effort. Right. Joe, how would you envision 
John Hennessy and John Edgemendi and sumo wrestler suits. <laughs> Do you think that would work at Stanford as a motivating force? <laughs> well, I, I don't think I've been here long enough to be qualified to say that, but I'd sure like to see it, I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, let the publicity hear that there's a recommendation to the leadership of our organization. <laughs> um, one of the themes that I'm hearing, and I think is really important from all of us, is that you do things internally, but you also have an external reach. And the place where this is I probably the most obvious is the university. So Joe, could you talk us a little bit about the relationship between what we do internally and the external reach of an organization like Stanford, the leveraging that we might have in relating our internal actions to our external roles? Sure. Uh, Stanford, of course, is a, a world-renowned institution of, of learning and research that has a great uh, global impact. Uh, it's responsible for many uh, leaders of the world and, and much innovation. Uh, we can learn a lot in operating our own campus from the deep thought and the great research that's being conducted uh, by faculty in all areas. So our approach to sustainability on campus is to take that body of knowledge and try and apply it to our real-world solutions in operating a sustainable campus. Uh, and by doing that, we can then um, provide an opportunity for the students to learn in a real environment, become sort of a living lab, and then inform back of those doing the critical thinking on much larger scales of some of the obstacles, technological, political, economical, that we may encounter in advancing our own campus to the levels of sustainability that we'd all like to achieve. So it's a great hand-in-hand -hand opportunity for us to learn and take advantage of all that knowledge and thought and research, and also to provide a living laboratory uh, for the faculty and students to try and see how to deploy this in real life. You next there, Peter. Yeah. Um, I think... Uh, and, yeah. and, and I want to focus on one thing. You sell consulting services and they matter. You do things internally. How related are those? Very. Um, I think people tend to watch what IBM is doing. Um, just as they, you know, watch our stock price on the stock market because we're one of the biggest um, uh, components of the um, of, of just about anybody's stock index. Um, people tend to watch what we're doing um, from a green point of view as well. As I mentioned, we're a, um, a very valuable brand in our own right, and um, we have to be seen to be walking the walk. Um, our chairman Sam Parmesano has specifically said we're not going to sell anything we're not doing internally because the risk of being found out for doing that is just too great. So the things we do internally are the things we do externally. And if we want to do something externally that we're not doing internally, we have to go back and get it done internally first, um, you know, in order to be able to keep that synergy going. And examples of that, um, managing our own um, data centers, that is now a service that we sell. Uh, managing energy uh, in buildings in general, that is now a service that we sell. Um, we make semiconductors, um, as, as some people may know, we make the computer chip that's inside the Xbox 360 the Nintendo Wii and the um, PlayStation 3. We're leveraging that expertise to make um, photovoltaic cells um, or um, develop technologies for photovoltaic cells anyway, whether we actually manufacture them remains to be seen. Um, so you've got that continuous traffic between what's going on inside the company and the products and services that we're selling outside. There's a completely sort of, um, you know, really kind of close linkage between the two things. And Chris? Yeah, I mean, in terms of the crosser. Well, I mean, you, you, you provide a lot of information services. Right. In fact, mm -hmm. you're an information services company when it ultimately comes down to it. And you, you have some wonderful web pages that tell people lots of things they can do. Are you doing all those internally yourself? Or is, 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 is there ways of improving the match between the advice that you're giving publicly and what you're doing internally? Right. I mean, I think it's a, a constant and continuous improvement in terms of what we're doing internally and, and what we're talking about and the educational opportunities that we're offering. We're, you know, in terms of consumers uh, and the information that we're providing on the web about what individuals can do, that's something we definitely encourage amongst our employees in the workplace, in the, the office center. We're also constantly, you know, as is IBM, looking for ways to improve things on the data center front, right. you know, both as an opportunity to improve our operating expenditures and 
you know, looking for things that potentially have a huge leverage point uh, on a national level, on an international level. Uh, the use of data centers is growing exponentially in this country. It's, it's going to go from about 60 billion kilowatt hours, according to the EPA, last year to, I think 2012 was supposed to be about 100 billion. So there's a tremendous opportunity there to have leverage and figure out better ways of doing that and share that. In IBM's case, share their services for that. Uh, you know, we've got an opportunity to drastically influence things and have, have an enormous impact, um, especially if we're able to share that information and encourage others to do the same. That's an issue that I think many people here may also worry about data centers, whether it's in, in the university, the preponderance of, uh, of computers and decentralized data centers, as well as many of the corporations out here that are involved in data centers. Uh, how big a potential is there for improvement there, uh, I think it's, Peter? It, it can be, it depends on the type of business you are. If you're Yahoo, your data centers are a major part of your environmental footprint. If you're an aluminum smelter, for the sake of argument, they aren't. Um, or if you're a retailer, actually, for that matter, they're not. Um, so it depends on the type of business you are. I think worldwide, data centers and the airline industry are about the same. They both contribute about two or three percent of the total um, greenhouse gas. Uh, problem at this point in time. So, by the way, does livestock farming. Um, so, you know, it's, it's kind of on, on that kind of level. It's definitely worth doing, and if you're a company like Yahoo and you particularly want to be green, or for that matter, a company like IBM and you particularly want to um, uh, Im uh, improve uh, your environmental footprint, then it's right and proper that that's something you sh that you should go after. But, you know, there in, in some businesses, there are going to be much bigger, uh, much, much bigger fish to fry. Now, Stanford also has an issue. Um, about data centers, more, not, not only are centralized, but the decentralized. What are we thinking about there, uh, aren't we? Well, there, there's some great initiatives by the Information Technology uh, Department on campus uh, to look at research computing. It's, it's grown tremendously, as, as these folks have indicated, and it's a, a common problem throughout the higher education uh, community. Uh, the great need for information and computing power has uh, applied a great additional electricity load and heating and cooling load on campuses. In many instances, new server rooms are installed in buildings that weren't engineered to supply the kind of cooling and temperatures that are needed, and it's thrown the building heating and cooling systems out of whack. So just in the raw energy required to do the computing, but there are collateral impacts on operating buildings efficiently. So our information technology group is looking at ways to consolidate research computing and uh, place it in modern, uh, well-designed facilities that may use perhaps one-sixth the collective energy that are being used now with the conventional way our server farms are set up. And that then carries over to administrative computing. Again, the proliferation of computers for email and uh, various things like that and the installations in different places around the campus that have caused great additional heating, cooling, and electricity loads through consolidation of some of these applications, both the hardware, uh, virtual consolidation of the servers uh, data-wise, and deploying new technologies that companies like IBM are developing of, of new low energy and low heat producing uh, equipment, uh, there's many opportunities to greatly reduce that load. And on Stanford, that could be perhaps over 10%, for instance, of just our electricity load uh, uh, right now. So we see great potential and a great uh, payback over the long term of making these moves to, to modern technology and server virtualization techniques. Um, would you recommend, we have many people out here who are students, and you sort of think about the career that you you you're running, Chris, right now. Would you recommend to people that they should uh, prepare to uh, take a job like yours and some other corporations? And if so, how should they prepare for it? Be flexible. Uh, truthfully, I think um, one of the key things that we're discovering is you need a very peculiar mix of skill sets uh, to do, and I'm not sure if you'd agree with me there, both of you guys. Uh, and so I think remaining true to what you're really interested in, rather than forcing yourself to be interested in something that you think is going to be marketable. Um, it's really, I think, a generation of renaissance folks uh, that are gonna be responsible for making a lot of sustainable decisions. Uh, and a group of people in different specialties. There's a tremendous need for engineers. There's needs for people with a business background. There's need for policy folks. So 
Um, one of the delightful things is if you want a career in sustainability, pretty much anything you're interested in, with the exception of, I don't know, French literature or something, is going to uh, have applicability and have, have a need. Because this, this market, I don't, I don't think the challenges are gonna get any smaller. Um, so I think flexibility and a willingness to say, okay, what are my skill sets and where does this fit into this? Um, I'd say in terms of businesses, you need, you need a, a variety. There, there needs to be a technical ability. There needs to be an ability to communicate. There needs to be a business acumen. So uh, I, th I think focusing on the things that you find most appealing and looking for what you see as being uh, the focus uh, from a sustainability perspective is a pretty good way to go. And um, it's all going to change in five years anyway, so. How would you add to that, Peter? I was laughing when you asked but, the question. The, do you like your job? I, I think it's the coolest job I've ever had, bar none. Um, I'm, I was laughing when you asked the question because I sometimes ask myself how I got here. My entire career is a monument to mismanaged serendipity. Um, <laughs> I, hey, give me five. <laughs> I, I, me I, uh, I, my, my first job, I was a political lobbyist in the UK. Um, then I became a strategy and change consultant in the UK. I accidentally ended up in America, um, still as a strategy and change consultant. Um, I gave up being that. I did a couple of jobs internally within IBM, and then I saw the fact that IBM was setting up Big Green Innovations. But, um, there was a sort of a story about it on W3, and I thought, that looks cool. So I wrote to the general manager who was setting it up, and I said, I reckon I can help you, and he believed me. Um, <laughs> so the, um, the characteristics that lead to the job, intellectual curiosity, I think, and a passion for it. Um, I, can't, I honestly can't add any more than that. And, and Joe, you, you came... Even though you came from the UC system, uh, you um, have a wonderful oh, okay. career coming here and have a continued wonderful career. Uh, what advice would you give people here about uh, if you want to have a job like yours, what else should they do to be thinking about getting there? Well, I think, again, a, a passion uh, to understand the magnitude of the challenge we face uh, sustainability for me hit home genuinely a few years ago when I became informed of, of the same science that has now led governments and cities to take action. It, it's, a, it's a great challenge. It's almost a global challenge. Uh, it's almost World War III. We found the enemy and it is us. And now the entire world from all countries, uh, we're uniting against the common enemy and that's global warming. And we all have a responsibility to uh, play and so uh, it's a great challenge to think that we're working globally with folks from around the world all doing our part uh, and it's a very concrete um, science there are uh, specific things that can be done it's uh, requiring a lot of innovation and, and creative thinking and there are many many areas that we can uh, improve uh, sustainability in particular global warming uh, I see all the time new technologies being developed uh, just the other day when I did an internet search to, to look for efficient equipment to make steam for the campus, for instance, I see one of the major boiler manufacturers, now that they've gotten the word, now that society's issued the demand and created the market, they're out there working feverishly to improve boilers, 15%, and it's very promising. And you see that in all kinds of uh, sectors. So there's some real work with some real products we can do now. It's almost like a green rush of uh, real services and products that we can uh, all develop that will improve the world and, and protect uh, the world for our own uh, future generations, our own children. So it's very rewarding and so definitely recognition of the uh, problem and a, and a passion to want to help solve it with the rest of the world. It's very rewarding. I've had so many conversations with students who are and maybe juniors and seniors and they're saying, I haven't figured out the whole rest of my life and I'm gonna start a career and, and that career, what I gotta do is gonna lock me into the life and I say, no way. I mean, what you really wanna do is be flexible, intellectually creative, find what you're really excited about and then figure out how to get somebody to pay you to do it. <laughs> and, and that's what I'm hearing from all of you, that, that there is no one route into this, that there's all sorts of opportunities for flexible people who may, uh, who may not have planned out their whole life, but, but who have a passion. Yeah, that's right, and they're willing to, um, willing to learn. I think the, the thing to do is to share the, the kind of wellspring of concern. I'll give you a very good example of what drives me. I, was, um, uh, I met with some scientists from uh, NOAA uh, last week, 
um, National o uh, Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. And one of them said to me that, the best, that as best as they can tell, if no action was taken on global warming, the chances of that proving fatal to the planet by the end of the coming century are somewhere between 15 and 20 percent. To put that in perspective, those are the same odds as playing Russian roulette. And that's what drives me. Except with a lot more bullets. <laughs> One for each of us. Um, that's what drives me. So there's a great job. But there must be some things that really are your biggest challenge that you give you, you know, give you a heartache, upset stomach, uh, up at night, whatever way you want to think about it. What are the biggest challenges, what are the hardest nuts to crack that you just haven't been able to, to deal with? And I don't care who goes next, uh, goes first. Uh, well, I'll, I'll venture. The, uh, some of the things I worry about are, are two things. One, that um, misinformation will attempt to cloud the challenge and divert our attention from it and, and take the wind out of the sails of the, of the great work that's being done all over on this. And number two, um, the time it will take to educate people to think really long term. I try and think about the things in stewardship we need to do for Stanford. That's an institution that's been around quite a while and will be around hopefully many more hundreds of years. And I apply them to my own home and I say, well, am I doing at home what I preach at Stanford? And I think, well, for some reason the incentive doesn't seem as strong there. Um, I don't envision owning that house for hundreds of years and passing it on to future generations. If I thought like that, I would make the efficiency improvements and change the practices in my home. So uh, educating people that this is a much longer term thing and it's a transformation of the way society works uh, may not lead to us directly going out and all retrofitting our entire homes because we don't see the practicality or cost effectiveness, but it can lead to behavioral change in our government to establish building codes and things so that new buildings, new houses are constructed that uh, include these kind of features so that they can be neutral to the occupant but will protect the planet and the future generations that, that come through these homes or these institutions. So uh, worrying that this, the wind isn't taken out of the sails by misinformation and finding a way to get everybody to think longer term when it doesn't seem in our immediate self-interest uh, in the short term. I think the biggest challenge challenges for me are um, this IBM is a very big company. There's so much going on. My big, one of my biggest challenges is simply keeping tabs on it all, because uh, people keep asking me about it, and it's embarrassing when I haven't heard about some amazing thing that's happening. Um, the the other challenge, I guess, going back to the comment I made earlier about IBM being a microcosm of society, when you get some very senior executive that just doesn't get it, um, you know, and you've got to you've got to work with them and persuade them, and um, either that or try and work around them to. Um, uh, to, you know, to achieve the things that you want to achieve. Um, that can be a challenge. Although sometimes it's not as challenging as when they do get it, but that's another story. <laughs> it's true. Chris, what keeps you up at night? Well, I mean, I'm interested because I think we all, all these are behavioral challenges. You know, there's oh, yeah. technology out there and you know, it's like, okay, if we just get 16% out of that PV instead of 14%. But a, a huge part of it is, is behavioral. And that, that's a good clue in terms of how you're training yourself while you're at Stanford, to, and take a couple of organizational learning classes while you're at it, or a psychology class, um, because a huge part of it's behavioral. Uh, I'd say there's a balance. You know, you're communicating urgency. You're communicating the really, really dire urgency and the magnitude of the problem right now, and still inspiring people and making them feel like there is hope and there is an opportunity for change. There's something that you personally can do today. Striking that balance um, when you're providing messaging and information, uh, that's a really tricky one. Because you know, we have exactly enough time starting today, and we have to start today. So hitting that exactly enough time and encouraging people to act, that's, that's a tricky balance. Great. I'd like to turn to the people out there for, for questions. Uh, but first, I want to recognize one, one other person. I hear that I'm, I'm, I feel very uh, honored and privileged to be the uh, first director of the pre court Institute for Energy Efficiency. And I do want to uh, uh, thank Jay pre court who is, is, is here, and his daughter, uh, Amanda pre court Spalding here, who is uh, 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 both here. And, and given that 
the, some of what I've heard, and I don't think there was any selective listening, where the real big action is for sustainability is energy efficiency in, uh, in these corporations. That's, you talked about some other things, but that's really where the action is. And so Jay's, what's, Jay's the person that's made that possible at Stanford uh, for a big stake in the ground for, for uh, moving towards energy efficiency. So thank you, Jay. And now I'd like to go to some questions from the floor with one caveat. These are not long editorials. These are not long <laughs> statements. They're questions. OK, on that side first. And, and please state your name first. And if there's something about your organization that everybody should know to figure out the bias or any other reason, state the organization. But otherwise, you need only state your name and a short question. Bruce Cahan. Um, I'm curious about another element of your corporate governance as it relates to sustainable thinking. Um, the university obviously has a fairly large endowment that it could benchmark in terms of sustainable goals. IBM has quite a, a big foundation. And I just wondered how you're approaching sustainability benchmarking when you look at how you invest your money as a pure investor. I have a, I, I'm not qualified to speak for the IBM endowment, but I can, I can make one or two observations about that. Um, when you do invest, there are companies out there now, um, one example that comes to mind, um, we have no particular relationship with them, I just use them as an example, is a company called InnoVest. They provide environmental risk ratings in exactly the same way as Standard & Poor's or Moody's would provide a credit risk rating for companies. I'm pleased to say IBM's InnoVest environmental risk rating is AAA. Um, so, you know, those ratings are out there. Um, they're available um, for people to use. Um, you can buy them, you can, you can get them on the internet. Um, I regret, I, I just don't know what IBM's policy is on that. I can find out if you like. Chris? Yeah, I'm in a similar position, you know, I think uh, just in terms of, you're starting to see the language change a bit in terms of how uh, investors and, and investor organizations are, are viewing this. Um, I think watching what the pension funds are doing nowadays is, is sort of an interesting development because that's a, a fairly conservative bunch of folks, justifiably so. And what they're looking at in terms of what they expect from how companies are making decisions about investments is starting to be influenced pretty heavily by things like climate risk. Um, in terms of Yahoo specifically, uh, that's, I'm, I'm in the same boat. So. And while the question wasn't addressed to Stanford, I, I, Joe, I think you should address yeah. some of the answer as well. Sure. Um, we, one of our main areas of sustainability is to examine what concerns society has about sustainability and, and Stanford's practice of it. And one of those uh, certainly is endowment transparency and investor priorities. I must admit, being new, um, we haven't got started on defining that and, and finding out what information we can share uh, with the public on that. But it is one of the nine sustainability working teams we've just convened this week with a specific goal of addressing that and, and sharing what we can. Thank you. My eyes aren't as good as I, they used to be. It looks like Rich there, though. Yes. My name is Rich Hilt. Um, like Groucho Marx, I, I have a tendency not to want to associate myself with any associations. Um, the, the, and the three of you are in the, in the sustainability business. Actually, the four of you, if Jim, you know, you've been doing it almost as long as me. Um, the sustainability issue being different than the sustainability business. Sustainability issue is going to continue on and on. How do you sustain the sustainability business? In, in other words, how do you keep yourself relevant within the organization? And what events might take place in the external environment that would make you irrelevant? Wow. Okay, I, uh, I, I could have a crack at that. The answer is actually you don't, paradoxically, um, in my view. You try and make sustainability the same as business as usual. Um, at the moment, a lot of companies are in the position where reducing carbon or reducing energy or trying to improve some other aspect of sustainability is some kind of exotic side issue that gets publicity all of its own. 
you'll know that companies are really getting it with sustainability when their carbon footprint, for the sake of argument, is given the same amount of credence as their inventory or their working capital or their customer service or all of the other variables that they manage on a day-to-day -day basis. In other words, sustainability has become part of the, absolutely part of the fabric of how that business is run day-to-day. -day. So my job, in a sense, in, in as much as I have an internal IBM focus, is to work myself out of a job because the company has got sustainability woven into everything it, uh, you know, absolutely everything it does. Yeah, a reminder to Satchel Page, don't look back, they may be gaining on you. Um, you know, I think it's, this, this field is not going to stay static. I wasn't kidding when it's gonna be completely different five years from now. I expect jobs like ours to be heavily mainstreamed, you know, yeah. uh, and incredibly common, you know, in all companies in a fairly short period of time. And, the role they play, the way these things are measured, the way decisions are made, uh, and how sustainability is practiced is gonna continue to evolve. Right. Um, so I, I'd like to think I could work myself out of a, a job in the next couple of years. I think the problems will continue to get sophisticated and the ways we deal with it will continue to get sophisticated. So I, I think we've got, for better or for worse, a certain amount of job security. Let me add to that. One of the things I find that, that's interesting talking with many people in many companies is most companies have either a formal or informal code of ethics that they have written. Like it's, it's um, some companies even, ha well, most companies will have in their code of ethics, you don't break the law even though it's more profitable to pay, break the law and pay the penalty. Uh, there, there are uh, sets of code of ethics of how, how you treat employees and how you treat uh, external customers. I think a lot of companies have been developing sort of implicitly and now explicitly as a code of ethics, um, stewardship of the environment, uh, paying attention to their impact on the environment, whether it's informal or formally, bring into that code of ethics. And once this starts becoming the code of ethics in an implicit or explicit way, just as some of the other things are, in some sense, you may have your wish that it, 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 you, you won't have sustainability coordinators because it's part of the, the fundamental ethics of the organization to begin with. You still will have engineers, you still will have managers, you still will have people will focus on energy efficiency, but maybe it will get, it is being integrated bit that's by right. bit. That's right, and that's when you know you've won, when, you, when you've got to that level. It's not something special or exotic. It's part of the day to day. Over this side. I was sitting here thinking about your job descriptions and about the structures of your organizations. So you guys are charged with creating sustainability within your organization, but the structure is such you have so many different business groups and functions and all these you know, different areas that don't report directly to you. So I'm wondering if you can talk about the difficulties that you encounter trying to push these measures within your company to... Um, on to people who don't necessarily report to you and how you kind of overcome that those, those problems. Um, we have a win-win here, I think, in that it's a very collaborative environment at the university. And the university also, I think, saw the wisdom in at least putting some of those direct operational areas within the sustainability and energy management department. With the utilities and parking and transportation units, we do have direct line operational control to uh, learn and improve our sustainable practices and supply of our energy and water and uh, so forth. So um, besides that though, with a collaborative environment, we can bring the, uh, the leaders of those operational administrative units who have the operational responsibility and authority for change together with those with specialized knowledge uh, such as faculty, uh, students, and uh, the broader community stakeholders into focus working teams to examine best practices in the world, look at what Stanford's doing, and then uh, come up with ways to advance our program. And they will have a lot of the resources and the uh, knowledge uh, just within those groups to affect change. And we have a mechanism with the higher sustainability working group and, and an executive campus leadership to take things beyond their policy or resource uh, uh, constraints uh, to this audience to seek even further change. So that's the way we're tackling uh, bringing uh, these diverse interests uh, and authorities around campus together to uh, affect change uh, in a very concrete way. 
Peter uses the largest organization, and therefore the most difficult to deal with it, probably. Oh, no, no question. I think the, um, I mean, I need to make it clear I'm responsible for the stuff that we sell externally, not for the things that we do internally. We have a head of corporate environmental affairs, um, and he has a fair sized team, and um, while he, you know, he tries not to use it too often, he carries a pretty big stick. Um, the, um, and, you know, the stick derives directly from IBM's corporate stance, which is endorsed directly by the chairman. Um, so, you know, in that sense, you've got a traditional kind of, you know, hierarchy of authority. He then has to influence people who he's not working with, and I'm quite sure in the normal run of things, he'll be, there'll be things he wants to do, and people will turn around and say, no, it's, it's too expensive. At which point he gets creative and figures out ways it can be done, you know, to satisfy whatever constraints that the other person is, is up to. The problem I have is, I, you know, I, I work, my team actually, the team I'm part of, um, only has eight people. We're, you know, a central neuron in the middle of an enormous network. Um, we, we're an incubator, we're developing products and services that we then have to go out and persuade the rest of the business that, you know, or, or we have to go and persuade IBM's research department to do the basic research on it for us, first of all, and we have to convince them that there's a reason for doing it. Then we have to go and persuade, for example, the consultancy or our systems and technology group to go out and sell this stuff. And you do it by persuasion um, and various other guerrilla means, you know, making sure that the guy's, you know, down to literally making sure that the guy's mailbox is completely stuffed up with press and PR about the thing you're trying to get him to adopt. Um, you know, there's a whole range of different things you can do. Um, but mostly it's about, it's about negotiation, it's about, you know, um, pointing out, you know, here's the ROI, here are the benefits, here's what we want you to do, here are the capabilities that we think you need to start building. So, yeah, it's very much kind of negotiated, I guess, is the overall word. We're very lucky, I'm very lucky in terms of my job because we do have executive support. You know, the, the commitment to our carbon neutral program comes from the co-founders from right at the top. So that's incredibly powerful. Uh, the other thing I'd say is we've got a huge number of volunteers who are committing their, their free time, and I use the term loosely because nobody has any, um, to green initiatives. It's something that people get very passionate about and very inspired about. And some of what I do is matchmaking between people's individual talents and passions and, uh, and a green initiative. So that's, that's one of the most fun parts of my job, I'd say. You know, the, the third thing is a huge number of these things have multiple benefits. So some of it is tapping into how does this particular initiative in our data centers affect both an increase in uptime, which you really care about, a decrease in tickets that our engineers need to deal with, and you know, it happens to shrink our carbon footprint a bit. There are lots of opportunities like that. And the last thing is, you know, I was at a, a nonprofit prior to this, um, and I would say that having to compete for mind share, it, it's a good thing. If your idea isn't particularly inspiring, compelling, cost effective, you know, well, maybe it's good that you can't get anybody to pay attention. Maybe that's the natural selection of the marketplace in terms of, well, come up with a better, more inspiring, more cost effective right. idea. A certain amount of selection. Not every idea I come up with is just going to be a dynamite one, unfortunately. So. Great. Thank you. Uh, over the other side. Hi, Bob Cormier with Foothill De Anza College District. A question primarily to Chris, but also to the whole group. Um, Chris, what do you see as the challenges in trying to position a message to different groups of, say, individuals, families, communities, small business, when you think about green energy versus efficiency versus carbon projects and um, in taking people to take initiatives about offsetting? Right. I know efficiency is the correct answer, but I thought I'd ask it anyways. You know, I mean, one of the nice things about a place like Yahoo is people think about the issue of demographics and people's point of view and their motivations 24-7. That's what we do. We have a, a huge audience, a very varied one. Um, so I think, I think the tricky thing is mind share um, and attempting to see things from the point of view of the demographic that you're trying to target. And it's going to vary. You know, we found a tremendous amount of the last couple of years about what we call chief household officers. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the people who run the house and make a lot of the buying decisions. Uh, Not you know, and, <laughs> but, um, you know, the, they're in fact behaving in quite sustainable ways. You know, you in, instinctively think of the college students, sorry, but actually a lot of the, the folks running the households are uh, really thinking about their footprint in part because of the economics of that, you know, whereas a way that appeal to a college student might be a little bit different. I do know you need to supply information, uh, and that's insufficient. If you stop there, you're, you're not in good shape. You need to supply a relative advantage to whatever it is you're doing. Uh, a little peer pressure doesn't 
hurt um, and making it outrageously convenient, reminding people constantly. Is, it's known as community, communal, socially based community marketing, and it's a pretty effective way to approach things. So. Mostly addressed to Chris, but if either of you want to add to the answer. No, it's a very full answer. I mean, it's a marketing issue, first and foremost, when you're at the individual level, isn't it? Yeah. Great. On the other side. Hello. Oli Lundberg. I was wondering if you find that the leads of building accreditation system is directly affecting the way you do buildings at your various organizations. And if it is affecting it, are you finding uh, those effects to be negative or positive? I think it's a tremendous benchmarking tool. You know, it's, I mean, especially if you get engaged with people who really think in terms of numbers. Um, my friend Paul Westbrook, back when I was working for Recommend Institute before I came to, to Yahoo, he, he was engaged in a tremendous initiative at Texas Instruments. And by looking at LEED certification, you got the engineers saying, can we get a point for this? And if they could get a point for this, they would work like heck to, to do it. So I think creating a framework like that can be tremendously valuable. And it's extending out to other areas, you know, LEED certification for data centers. That's all you do. And you, you don't sort of look at the, the, the 30,000 foot level. What are the implications for us as a company? How do we integrate this? How do we retain the system's perspective? Um, and you don't fall slave to the checklist. Uh, then there's some unintended consequences you can run into. Yeah, I mean, our approach to improving the sustainability of our buildings actually is to have as many people as possible work at home. And 40% 40, 40 of IBM works at home, um, which is actually better than the lead building, if you think about it. Um, that said, we have, um, you know, the, in terms of what it means to our business, certainly in the data center area, it means a good deal, um, as you might imagine. Um, we are, I think, generally selling rather than buying real estate, certainly in the United States. Um, we have some lead buildings. Um, our Austin research um, campuses, I believe, lead bronze, I think, um, and one or two others as well. But uh, the, the biggest direct influence I think you probably find in our data center area. And certainly at Stanford, uh, share Chris's viewpoint. LEED's been a great awareness tool, uh, a, a great public awareness tool, and a, and a great technological tool to inform us of some of the things we can do to make buildings greener. But as Chris mentioned, there are areas of it that we'd like to see adopt and change as the challenges we face have changed, such as uh, greenhouse gases and global warming. At the time LEED was put together, this may not have been recognized as significant an issue. And so uh, saving energy and reducing greenhouse gases may not receive as many points, for instance, as today we might think uh, is in the best interest of the environment. So uh, it's been a great tool uh, for society, and, and we support its continued advancement uh, to a state where it can truly serve each of those sectors of the industry um, in the best way. And so higher education may have certain needs uh, than commercial buildings and so forth. So uh, we hope to work with LEED and try and influence some, some changes that'll, that'll serve the different sectors uh, with the modern challenges we face a little better, but it's, it's been a great tool for society. The other side. Hi, my name is Anna Aliotto. I'm the development director at Hidden Villa. Uh, we're an environmental education farm in the Los Altos Hills. I like to say we were green before green was cool. <laughs> my question to you um, is in regard to your food choices for your organizations. Um, there's a lot of emphasis now on purchasing organic, purchasing locally, um, keeping it more sustainable, and I was just wondering what your organizations are doing. You know, Ed, Michael Pollan was here last night. I don't know how many of you went to see that. It was a tremendous speech. You know, I love our cafeteria. Uh, we work with uh, our caterers, Bon Appetit. They supply our food services. and. Again, not to flog the information theme, but we've got signage everywhere about things like sustainable fisheries, uh, local food, organic food, vegetarian options throughout our cafeteria. You're inundated with these labels everywhere that tell you everything you may or may not want to know about what you're eating that day. Um, and they in particular have a definite commitment to sourcing locally, offering vegetarian options, offering healthy choices. and that's. For us, tremendous. We, we just want to, um, it's called a proggy. It's an award from the People for Ethical Treatment of Animals for the, uh, the offering and the signage around uh, vegetarian options. The other thing, being the, car the carbon geek, is, that I'd say is uh, there's a tremendous amount to be gained by having a cafeteria 
on your campus. So individual people, your thousands of employees, don't have to get in their cars and drive somewhere to eat and drive back. Um, as well as a real sort of uh, laboratory in terms of educating people about where their food comes from. Yeah, I regret, as I say, my main focus is external. And I hardly use our cafeterias anyway, because I work out of my home also. So I don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, sir. Certainly, I've, I've become aware of some of the, the great programs that uh, residential and dining enterprises here on campus have, have done, and uh, they've invested a lot of time and effort in trying to um, establish relationships with local food vendors and, and promote those concepts, and they've done a lot. Um, we will be uh, assembling a group, a procurement, food, and recycling group to, to focus and look at even uh, more opportunities for improvement and sustainability in, in that area. Got great grass-fed beef here. Right. <laughs> I've got uh, two bits of evidence that it's time for the, ho the hook is coming out. I see Jeff on the stairs and somebody's giving me a one minute marking. So I'm going to have to cut off the questions, but I want each of you to take at most a minute if there's a last thought. We've covered a lot of ground here, but there may be something you wish you were asked that you would like to just make a final closing comment. And uh, um, Chris, you want to go first? Or? Or last? You prefer to go I'll last? I'll go last. You'll yeah, go last. Okay. Make sure what else well, by yeah. default, at this end, I'll go first. And, and that is to inform yourself. Educate yourself. That, that's what Stanford's in the business of doing. Besides creating knowledge, is disseminating knowledge. It was the most uh, powerful thing for me to become informed of the facts. And they're quite compelling each time I see them, such as yesterday's Global Climate and uh, Energy Project five-year anniversary. The more I see the facts and how fast things are changing, the more I'm compelled as just a normal, pragmatic, regular citizen for change. So while we can't expect behaviorally you, all of you to go out and uh, empty your, uh, your uh, savings out and you know, reform your house and, and all your practices, you can inform yourself and support the longer term changes that we need of our government to take action. And these can be seamless. Um, airbags are something we have in all of our cars. Now, if 10 years ago, Everybody pointed out the risks of accidents to us and said, will you go spend $2,000 to retrofit your car? You'd probably say that's not practical. But it's easy to get behind that idea and say, you know, this really is good. This really is the best of us. We will learn to absorb these costs and deploy these technologies and changes to make our lives better. So inform yourself of the need for that and then support uh, these kind of efforts so that behind the scenes we can do the research and provide the services that will advance society out of this challenge. Peter? I think, uh, I mean, as, as wide ranging as the discussion has been, there are whole areas that it hasn't touched on that you may be interested in, things like, you know, how to run a green supply chain, uh, green product design, um, and issues like that. You know, there's a whole extra conference you could have on that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I was thinking part of an earlier conversation was, uh, you know, what does success look like? I'd say that midterm success, because long term success is we've dealt with the problem of climate change entirely, um, is, you know, where it's second nature for. 500 million users to think about their carbon footprint, think about their carbon impact, the way they check their cholesterol. It's just second nature. It sort of makes good common sense. And for us and other companies to, to think about, as, as a part of all their business units, uh, the carbon impact of, of things. We get a really a good awareness of that, awareness of how we benchmarked it, how we're improving, and where we need to go next in terms of improving it further. Uh, that, that looks like success in the, in the midterm. So I'd like to just end up with a comment directly towards, towards the students here. I think if you listen to what our panelists have said, there's one conclusion that you definitely can, can, uh, can reach. That is, if you want a very satisfying career, there's some wonderful opportunities here from which whatever intellectual background you're start, starting with, and a way of keeping yourself uh, very gainfully employed and doing interesting things through the rest of your life. So I hope some of uh, the students particularly here understand there's just wonderful lifetime opportunities from the type of things that you're hearing today. And on that point, I'd like to thank our three panelists and turn it to the next panel. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.